So the second topic, this is probably actually the longest one out of them, because there's, 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 there's the most stuff you can talk about, arguably the most interesting as well actually. Um, so there's the, there's the extent to which state intervention in the public sector are rolled back. So, that, so this phrase, rolled back, um, to my understanding it's a phrase that Thatcher herself uses, she claims, she claims in an interview that she rolled back the frontiers of the state. In other words, um, when we talk about, when we talk about the, state, the state intervention, you know, it's how far or how much does the state get involved in just public life. That can be in the economy, it can be in, yeah, in a range of different things. Um, you know, how people, you often hear this phrase, it's a very, it's a very abstract phrase, the size of the state. We always said, you know, when we talk about the size of the state, you know, a big state is a state which intervenes and interferes in your life in a range of different ways. That can be in regulating the economy. That can be in um, restricting certain things you can or can't do. So it can be in, say, perhaps restricting your civil rights or civil liberties. It can be through um, enforcing, I don't know, um, other laws. So if you're being in school, for example, if you're, if you're in school, if the government has a very significant say on what you study, again, that is the hallmark of a large state or a, 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 a sizable state. And you're going to ask? Okay. Um, there's a bit of an abstract one, but the way, the, way, the, the way that you can often think about it is this. Like, ways in which you as a person kind of interact, or your life is kind of governed or determined by actions that are chosen or made by the state itself. And so Thatcher kind of comes in, again, with this very sceptical idea of the state, and on two levels, um, the way in which it kind of um, governs the economy and also people's individual freedoms as a result. Um, and so there's an argument that actually um, Thatcher claims to have rolled the state back, but in reality, she fails to prevent the state's growth. And actually, the 1980s, despite her claims, are a period of increased state intervention, and the proof is in the pudding. Um, more specifically, the cost, increased cost of things like welfare, the increase in things like law and order, or the, or the, or the um, powers of the law enforcement officials. Um, others may suggest that actually, that state intervened less in people's lives than, than before, and that actually should allow the market forces to determine many more outcomes. So we're going to kind of come back to some of the things about the economy, but more briefly. Um, the final argument, and this, is, this topic then kind of has a, a, a more nuanced argument, is that actually the state wasn't rolled back, but its role was simply changed. Or actually that the local government in some places was rolled back, but replaced with government in other areas. So the best example of this is the situation of local government. So you've got left-wing local councils having their powers reduced and having their powers stripped, um, but then the central government instead takes their powers instead, and they make decisions as opposed to local government. Um, so we'll, we'll look at that idea as well, how far the role of government simply changes as opposed to is reduced. So, um, before we kick off with this, it's just worth mentioning that Thatcher arguably has contradictory beliefs in terms of state intervention. If you consider her ideology to begin with, she has contradictory ideas. She spoke of wanting to roll back the state, but in reality she had a more complex ideology. So it's clear that she wanted to roll back the state, undoubtedly on two fronts. The economy, she wanted the state to have no role, very little role in the economy. Additionally, she wanted to reduce government expenditure on wealth, on, think, on aspects of welfare and social security. Um, again, she would link that to state intervention by arguing that individual freedom isn't possible if you're reliant upon the state to kind of look after you. Um, However, at the same time, she clearly believed in strengthening of the state being necessary to protect those same political and economic freedoms in the face of different threats, like the Soviet Union, for example, abroad, like powerful trade unions at home seeking to cause trouble, um, crime being another thing that, again, the state should be quite strong in dealing with and will have strong powers to deal with, um, and as we'll look into as well, things like left-wing councils. So, on, from the outset, she kind of has this contradictory set of beliefs. On the one hand, yeah, we want to reduce the state's interference in some things, but actually, to achieve some of our other policies, she needs the state to increase in size. Um, so, some of these things should now be, uh, be here. So, 
first thing that we're going to go over is how she... So I'm going to go over the, the way I'm going to organize this. I'm going to go over ways in which you can argue she rolls back the state. And then we're going to go over ways in which um, the, she actually simply changes the role of the state. And then finally, um, ways in which the state's size increases. Um, so, the first one is she rolls back, she rolls back the state in terms of the economy. And it's something which we didn't really go over in the last one. Um, we'll come into it this one. Another kind of complex idea to get your head around that I'm going to try and keep quite straightforward um, is this idea of corporatism, uh, which we mentioned when we did the economy lecture briefly. Well, not briefly, trying to explain it. So, corporatism, in a nutshell, it's a idea or principle or policy or corporatist policies is where the government negotiates with businesses and union leaders to create common policies on pay and prices, etc. So, how does that work in principle? The government will actually negotiate with trade unions and businesses together to, for example, convince trade unions to accept certain pay increases, also to work with businesses to set prices. So the government actually plays a role alongside businesses and the unions in setting things like prices, wages for workers. Okay? So clearly, the government has very significant influence and a role to play in aspects of the economy. Like I said, prices and, prices and, um, and pay being the best example of that. Um, Thatcher is quite highly critical of this idea. Um, and so one of her one of her chief allies, a guy called Morgan Tebbit, really well known. Um, he's, a, he's sort of like her attack dog. He's like her, her super like fan who will do everything she asks and believes in her like words. It's like religious scripture. Um, he would basically argue that actually corporatism is undemocratic and it's a characteristic of fascist government that actually you're going behind closed doors that are government negotiating things with like good businesses and, and, and trade unions um, but that's, the, that's the whole undemocratic side of it um, and more importantly Thatcher completely abandons corporatist policies um, she stops negotiating with major unions on issues of economic policy completely so she no longer negotiates with them Prior to 1979, the unions come down the street and they negotiate with the government, and she also stops uh, negotiating with the CBI on things, again, like prices, etc. Instead, prices of goods, wages, etc., they are to be determined by the free market. And so, things like prices and wages under Thatcher are no longer dictated or decided by the government. Private businesses and the free market instead decide what the price of an item should be, what the wage of a worker should be, and the government has no role in deciding what that is. Okay? So the state intervention is reduced in terms of decisions like that. The second then, um, way in which the economic state comes to the economy is they basically abandon Keynesian economic policy. So we're not going to go into the intricate details of exactly what Keynesian, Keynesianism was, um, but just think of it very simply as in times of low economic growth, the government intervenes in the economy to make the economy grow more by introducing policies that would help stimulate growth. So things like cutting taxes. If you cut taxes, people are more willing to spend. They spend it, the economy grows. Um, you increase spending in the economy itself, again, to help, kind of help create growth if possible in places. Cutting interest rates. Um, so again, increase spending. So government um, helping... Economy. Yeah, the government, the government intervenes in the economy to try and create growth, um, or policies that try and create growth in some way. And so, Thatcher is completely opposed to Keynesian economics for two reasons. First of all, very obvious because we've mentioned like a dozen times so far, um, Keynesian economics, she believes, create inflation. Like, broken record now, repeating that point over and over again. Um, Keynesian economics help to create inflation, or high inflation. Additionally, um, it seemed to interfere with the natural function of the free market. She's one of these people who believes in, you know, the free market has to be left to its own devices to sort out its own problems. If there is a recession or if there is low growth, the market will eventually solve it. The government shouldn't be intervening. Um, and so she's massively opposed to Keynesian economics. Um, and so... 
Similarly, you have her abandoning these kinds of ideas. Instead, as we talked about before, she adopts things like monetarism, privatization, etc. Um, So in this, in this way, she didn't actually roll back the state that much? She did. Previously, the state actually gets involved in when, like, when, there's, when there's a recession, for example. This is, so this is what she's, she's against this. No, I'm saying, but at the end, it says, however, government arguably did not cease to intervene in that policy. Sorry, I forgot, sorry, I forgot that one. I couldn't forget that one. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, the argument on the flip side is that, actually, yeah, again, is that in reality, the way the government intervened just changed because, yeah, like I said, she introduced monetarism. And so monetarism is still a form of some state intervention. You just changed from Keynesian policy to monetarist policy instead. Yes, you're right. Um, so she still intervenes in the economy to try and control inflation. Um, yeah? So can you just say that in the intervening in the different way? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what you could say. So, so if you see one extract, talk about how she reduced state intervention in the economy, you could be like, no, but she's still introduced, she's still your monetarist policy, which is intervention, just they're just different aims. So what's monetarist again? Priority to control inflation. Okay. And that can, that can mean things like raising interest rates, for example, to control, to control inflation. Um, you like that, but then... It's not going into that. My, I fluctuate day by day. I'm very. I'm one of the few people who's a bit neutral. Believe it or not, such such a person as me who, who's neutral towards that shit actually exists. Um, okay. So the other big rollback um, is the public sector more broadly. Okay. So she wants to end the role of the of, of much of the public sector's work. She claims that. Individual freedom and well-being is more important than policies that promote welfare of society as a whole. Thatcher has this kind of obsession. That's an obsession. She believes that you know society is made up of individuals, not collective. It's not she's not she's not collectivist. In other words, she doesn't support um, policies that are kind of designed to sort of help sort of society collectively. Um, but more important is that I won't worry too much about that. More important about that as a result is she believes that state action is counterproductive and inferior to the actions of private companies and, and individuals, as we've mentioned several times already. So that's a very basic point. So where does that, how does that manifest itself? Um, first though, which we've not talked about, is housing. When it comes to shrinking the state, one of the really common things we've talked about is housing. So Thatcher was really keen to reduce the number of council houses. Um, so this, this idea that People like Thatcher and conservatives like Thatcher, for them, allowing people to buy homes is considered to be so important. Like home ownership is aspired to as being this really productive and important social function. Because actually, uh, home ownership does something to the, to the individual. It makes them a responsible, self-reliant person. They're no, they're no longer relying upon the state to provide them with housing. They have their own home. Additionally, owning your own home it makes you feel more responsible because you don't have a stake in society. You have something. Um, you have something that can, you have something for yourself, right? So you kind of you want you want it to kind of be taken care of. Um, yeah, you kind of you you've got a stake in society as a result of you know owning your own home. And there's something for you specifically which you own, um, and you become you therefore become independent of the state itself. Um, Again, the ideological stuff's a bit fluffy. Um, it's not too important to understand that bit. The net result is this. Thatcher extends this policy which Labour had begun in the 70s, but she took it like full throttle. Uh, and she, she basically gives council house tenants the right to buy their homes. So the policy is often referred to as a right to buy. And you'll often hear in the news these days as well, like extension of right to buy. Um, and so she passes in 1980 this Housing Act, and it gives council tenants, if they had been living in their home um, for three years, a 33% discount on the right to buy their house. And if they've been living there for 20 years or more, you could buy it for 50% of its value. Quite a big. 
that's a massive chunk, especially if you're somebody who has been, let's say, quite reliant on the state. You've been there for 20 years. Um, and so, yeah, choose the policies to make it much easier for people to purchase their council homes. Yeah. I don't understand. She's doing all this stuff here for people who don't have much money. So why do people say she's so interested? So again, she's so she's helping out like uh, people with a lot of money, right? But why do people always say she like is so um, just focuses on helping people with money out? Depends who you ask. That's why. So on that same point, if we look at the numbers, <coughs> the numbers show that about half a million people. Um, buy council homes every year between 1980 to 1989. The rate decreases slightly, but essentially by 97, they had sold 5 million state-occupied or state-owned homes to private tenants. Um, what? How's that? Okay, that, that's a typo. So, okay, there's this, the, this owner occupation. So. The number of people, yeah, okay. So owner occupation, that's basically the number of people who own the homes they are living in. So if you, if you take the number of people in the country living in homes, what percentage of people own the homes they live in? In 1981, it's half the country are owner occupiers. They live in a home and they, and they own it. Half the country is basically renting or living in council housing that they're not paying for. Um, by 89, that number has risen to three quarters. So three quarters of the population by 1989 are living in homes they themselves own. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, matters, it significantly it shrinks the size of um, the state. It allows a lot of people to also have their own homes. Um, additionally, um, council houses them, councils themselves, after selling the homes, they could not use those sales to build new homes. And therefore, you see a decline in council houses being built. So the state's role in building and providing housing for people starts to shrink and retrench over this period as a result. And so by the end of that period in office, in 97, the state effectively is no longer building homes for people. That's no, that's no longer a function of them anymore. Um, in addition to actually shrinking the size of how much they own in terms of, ha in terms of housing, they also stop building them as well for the most part. Um, I, think, well, I, was, I think I was going to mention that point you asked, that's why I've not responded to it yet. I don't know if it is it in here or not. Hang on. I think it might not be, it might be, it might not be. We'll see if it comes up to that. But essentially, um, there is an argument that actually. Actually, I, I'm going to come back to it in, in a later um, presentation. I'll mention it here briefly. You know, for, I mean, like, even things like right, like right to buy. If you're somebody who bought a home under right to buy, most of those people tend to be quite pleased with Thatcher. It's like you know, and you, you often see people who are like working class but quite conservative. They'll often talk about how you know, a conservative government helped me buy my own home. Um, if you didn't benefit specifically from her, then obviously the situation is very different. So it depends on who you are, what, what benefits you receive, and what you didn't. Um, that's kind of a different topic. Essentially, how people's experience of Thatcher, of Thatcherism, or her government is very different. So it kind of helps create divisions in some ways. Um, very right. for, for this topic in particular, you don't really, hopefully, you won't get any question about whether these policies were good or not. It tends to be the extent to which she shrinks the state or not. Um, so that hopefully shouldn't be a question that should actually come up. Um, okay. Um, the next bit, I'm going to roll through this very quickly because we've mentioned it in detail already, so no need to mention it again. But obviously, prioritisation, we've mentioned it already, um, is clear evidence of the, size of, public set, of the size of the public sector being shrunk. Um, how Tamil's office, due to prioritisation, clearly shift the balance of the economy away from public and towards the private sector. Um, and privatisation continues after she leaves office as well. So John Major privatises more industry. And so the state, in terms of the sectors it controls, continues to shrink. And in terms of like employees, you've got 600,000 fewer people being employed by the state as a result. Um, so that's the simple one. We're going to go to something like that again because we've really covered it. Um, the next rollback is in the civil service, or the final purpose of the rollback. So, because I remember last year we did it, everyone was like, 
like, what's the civil service? Um, in a nutshell, in some cases, civil service in most countries is simply public sector employees. So I believe in America, they call civil servants public servants. In other words, any public sector worker. Britain's a little bit different. The definition of a civil servant is basically this. It is any public sector employee that works directly for the central government. And by central government, they define that specifically as the crown. You work for the crown. Um, that basically means like central government. H and revenue, Her Majesty's prison, Her Majesty's prison service, etc. Anything like that. Is that anyone in prison? Is there anyone in prison? I think any prisons. There any private prisons? Ah, I'm going to come to that point. I'm literally going to come to that point. That's a good question. That's a very good question. So, just to do it for so just briefly on this point, just so you don't get confused. Because last year, people were like, so our teachers civil servants. The answer is no. So, it's, it's people who are, it's public, public sector workers who are employed by the Crown, as opposed to local government or other kind of sectors. So, it doesn't include things like the NHS, because that's local. It won't include teachers, because again, those are mostly local um, sorry, local government um, employees. It doesn't include the army, um, things like that. Um, but it does include things like the prison service, because the prison service is run by, run by um, well, the Crown. So any, anything which begins HM is, is civil service, or civil servants. Benefits and things like that, pensions, they're all done by the civil service, um, the civil servants. So, Thatcher is unhappy about the size of the civil service, okay, so those are the, those are the, the central government of public sector, public workers. They have, in terms of numbers, over 700,000 workers or employees when she takes office. To kind of give that a bit of comparison, that is three times the size of similar countries. So there clearly was a very bloated and excessive size of the civil service. And so she wished, she wished to reduce their numbers. So what she does is she creates this, um, thing called the management, system, the management Information System, which is basically this organisation or body which seeks to reduce, monitor and reduce the cost of the civil service. Cost reduction, as I mentioned beforehand, it basically means job losses. Um, whenever you hear job um, um, cut, cost cutting, efficiency savings, it means someone's losing their job. Um, that's a plan of saying that. So it means job losses. And so they successfully managed to make um, by the end of the 80s, a billion pounds in efficiency savings. Again, that, mean, that being largely through job losses. And so the, the way they do that is by reducing numbers by 25%. So a quarter of civil servants lose their jobs, basically, um, by this period. Um, the other thing they do, so this comes up to the question that Molly asked, um, agencies become required, or civil service agencies become required to work more with the private sector to work more efficiently. So, you asked, do you have private prisons? The answer is, kind of. What happens is, and this is where a lot of the stuff with the prisons recently become a problem, so you've got all the prisons are, their HM, their Her Majesty's prisons. So HM, Wormwood, Wormwood Scrubs, for example. Um, but then what happens is, um, a lot of these, the prison service contracts private security companies to look after the prisons? So the answer is yes, you do get public, um, you do get private sector working in, um, in, 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 with, with, under the civil service. Um, and you increasingly have a lot of civil service agencies that are like semi autonomous and they use, again, large aspects of, they use private sector so public workers. Sector, you use, like, uh, use what? You, so you, you, have, you have an increase in civil service agencies relying upon, pub, on private sector contracts to do jobs for them. Like I said, for example, G4S running prisons. G4S is a, is a private, private company. They run prisons in this country. But prisons are actually under the crown itself. So, that, that's, so the civil service increasingly has private sector companies or private companies doing their jobs for them, or parts of their jobs. To make it, again, the idea is to make it more efficient. Um, so again, she managed, to, she managed to shrink the size of the civil service or the state's bureaucracy um, by cutting jobs and also increasingly bringing in public and private companies to do the jobs for them. Um, this next one, 
um, rolled back in the state in terms of the welfare state. So those are all public sectors. The next thing is the welfare state. Actually, I'm going to argue that the Thatcher government didn't shrink the welfare state, but she did try to attempt to do that. So I'm actually going to give a counter argument for this. Yeah. Is this a bit pronounced like she didn't? Really? No, I'm saying I'm, I'm going to make this point later. So I'm going, to, I'm going to give a counter argument later on. So, yeah. But I'm just saying, so for this, um, this is simply an attempt. Thatcher tries to reign in the welfare state. And it's worth saying, she wasn't publicly wholly opposed to the welfare state. She's against welfare dependency. Um, and so she wants to rein in the welfare state because it's become, in her mind, a bit too excessive, a bit too large. Um, but she's not opposed to things like the NHS, for example. She wouldn't dare um, try and scrap it because she knows what happened. Um, so, she doesn't actually propose things like privatising the NHS. What she does do, very familiar language, is she tries to make it more efficient. And so, the way she does that, similar to the civil service point, um, is she tries to, re she requires hospitals to buy some services from the private sector. So again, if you go to hospital now, you'll find that some of the things that hospitals do um, is... Um, done it privately. So I think things like x-rays, I think you get done privately, maybe not quite, but I don't know as much. But again, there are some services, you'll go to the NHS hospital, but then you go to a private company and they do certain things, so you have certain checks, for example. Um, so she, they, 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 it requires hospitals to buy services from the private sector. Additionally, it sees the creation of something what we now call the NHS internal market. I'm try to make this one a bit clear, if I can. So, Prior to this point, NHS hospitals are under the control of local health authorities. Okay? So what she does is, hospitals become independent of local health authorities. And instead, every hospital is basically part of an independent NHS trust, as they're called. What that means in practice is this. They no longer receive money directly from... Um, they no longer receive money directly from the government. Instead, what happens is the local health authorities lost their control, direct control over the hospitals. Instead, what happens is the government gives money to the local health authorities and those health authorities then buy services from the NHS trusts. So, NHS trusts, yes, essentially they buy, they buy contracts or give money to NHS Trust, but essentially buying their services. What that means in principle or in practice is that the idea is hospitals therefore have to compete for funding. That is the basic point of that, so just note that down. Hospitals as a result have to compete with each other for funding. Um, so they have to compete for funding, and so again the idea is it makes them more efficient. Um, she tries other things to, re to reign in the welfare state, so they introduced the 1986 Social Security Act. Um, what it does is it brings in means testing. Means testing meaning to apply for a benefit, you have to meet a certain requirement. Okay? Um, so it introduced means testing for some benefits that were previously universal, aka there will be a benefit which previously everybody, could, everybody would receive, but then it becomes means tested, so actually some people no longer get it as a result. Um, and that's designed to stop rising costs and make it harder to claim some benefits. I tried to look up examples of what benefits became means tested, but the actual benefits themselves, then they're nothing you would recognise because they're like things from like the 1970s. So like these all changed anyway, so there's no point mentioning it. Um, so some benefits become means tested as opposed to being universal. So not everyone get them anymore. Not everyone can now get them. And then. Lastly, she also tries to encourage people to take up private pensions more than public pensions by trying to make state pensions a bit less attractive. Yeah? Um, isn't Social Security an example of state pensions that is public? So she tries to reduce it, essentially. So previously, you've got examples of Social Security that everyone gets. And she tries, she tries to rein it in by making some of these benefits means-tested. Not everyone gets them. To get them, you have to qualify by having certain criteria. But wouldn't that involve more government 
In the sense that you have to conduct a means test, yeah, yeah true. Um, but the goal, though, ultimately, is to reduce the number of claimants. So, yeah, obviously, you need, you need, you're right, you do need the state to intervene in some way to actually, you know, in other words, you need, you need a civil service for that, to actually go and do means tests. But they already exist to begin with, anyway, like job centres, things like that. Um, but yeah, you are right, to an extent. Um, okay, so... This next one I'm going to go through is, like I said, ways in which she rolls back local government, but she does it by strengthening central government. So there's, there's, um, there's a, this argument can go either way. You can say that, yeah, she rolls back local government, but then you can then give the counter-argument, but she does that by strengthening her own powers. So, Thatcher's program for state rollback put her on a collision course with local government for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, it, the local government itself was quite significant in size. Um, so actually, local government accounted for about one third of all government spending, uh, which is quite significant. Secondly, as just as many local authorities were actually trying to expand some of their services, the reason being, I'll just go to Rick with you in a sec, Thatcher's obviously trying to shrink the public sector. In particular, you've got a situation where a lot of local councils were being controlled by various very left-wing Labour strands. So you have, for example, Ken Livingstone in charge of the GLC, the GLC being the Greater London Council. So Ken Livingstone's in charge of the Greater London Council, the GLC, him and a bunch of other very left-wing Labour members. You've got a very different kind of very left-wing Labour faction, uh, who are basically Trotskyists. Don't worry what Trotskyists are, that's not a necessary discussion, but they're an even more sort of um, militant left-wing um, group. Um, so they're a Trotskyist group called Militant Tendency, um, who basically infiltrate Labour in the 1980s to try and use them as a vehicle for their like Trotskyist revolution. So there's a Trotskyist faction who are in charge of Liverpool City Council. Like, we're talking about proper extreme like left-wing communists, or Trotskyists. Trotskyists, not communists. Um, it's, like, it's, like, I'm not, it's like, yeah, the intricacies of various communist factions, I'm not going to go into it. Um, so, naturally, you've got all these left-wing councils, they were going to always be on a collision course with Thatcher. Uh, and Thatcher herself believed that those left-wing councils were trying to introduce socialism into the country, and was determined to therefore curb their powers and stop that from happening, and take them on basically. And so, in terms of local government, the 1980s, that was a big collision course with um, these left-wing councils. Um, so the first thing she does is, she initially attempts to pass laws that reduce their funding. How do I, how, how do I shrink your size? I give you less money, because the, the, cause local councils get funding from the central government. Not all their funding, some of their funding comes from the central government. However, their response to her cutting their funds is to increase local rates or local taxes. So things like council taxes, etc. If, if, if Thatcher cuts their funding, they just start taxing local people more. So it makes no difference, basically. So then she responds in 1984 by doing something called the Rates Bill. And that basically gives the central government the power to impose a cap on local taxation. So they defied her by just increasing their own local taxes, and so she basically introduces legal rates and caps which local councils cannot charge more than. It doesn't end there though. 18 councils across the country, including um, the Liverpool City Council, the Trotskyists, including Livingston and the GLC, and some other Labour councils, um, they initially rebelled against the government, they set illegal rates. They basically flout her law and go, we don't care, and they set, again, high local tax rates um, initially. However, that campaign falls away after a couple of years, and it doesn't really last. It falls apart essentially because, um, yeah, it falls apart and all those councils eventually comply. The reason being, because there's quite wide, um, widespread local, sorry, widespread public divisions, um, 
between those different councils. So you have some councils that um, are quite the movement as others. You have Neil Kinnock, who's the Labour Party leader, openly criticises some of those councils, um, etc. Additionally, the government itself negotiates quite intelligently. Um, oops. Um, additionally, um, sorry. additionally, the government itself um, negotiates quite intelligently. They basically um, approach about six councils and negotiate with them and allow them to basically set higher rates, which again undermines their campaign. And so she successfully manages to stop councils from setting higher rates and rebelling against their rates, um, and the campaign basically falls apart. Um, the um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, surely, though, like this, is this is, did you say it's an against point, though? Because it's like roll back in the local government by setting central government, surely, is not a I'm going I'm I'm to mention the, the point against in a sec. Um, so, this is still a fall. So, it, it's, you can argue it both ways. You can say that, yeah, she's strict, she um, reduces the size of local government. On the one hand, as you said, so she does do that, and that is clearly a reduction in their power and their ability, for example, to set high tax rates. Then, just in a second, there are, at the same time, you can argue that actually she's strengthening her own power in doing so. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll say oh, it's not necessarily a negative point. It's just, it's just it, I see what you mean. Yeah. You can, yeah, you can use it either way. So you can use, you can use the example of local government cutbacks as as evidence that she shrunk the state, and you can then counter it by saying. But to do that, she increases her own power. Yeah. I was just going to say, do you like write the point and then at the end just go however? So I mean, yeah. If, if you're using it, to, if you if you've got an extract yeah. where the historians are basically trying to use the local councils, exactly. In particular, let's say the guy there's an extract where he tries to claim the local councils are an example of her cutting back the state. You can use that as a counter argument on that exact same point to then critique what he's saying exactly. Um, so, the next thing to result to really shrink the size of the state and local, local government, um, it's the 1988 Local Government Act. Um, again, this policy will sound quite familiar because she's doing it everywhere. Um, civil service, um, NHS, etc. Um, so, it forces councils to buy in or contract out services from the private sector rather than provide them directly. Um, the best example of this is, into, or rather, she, she basically wants their basis to follow the example of conservative local authorities who have been experimenting with this policy quite successfully from her, from her perspective. So, an example of this is Wandsworth Council, which starts this experiment of getting private sector companies to, to, to do rubbish collections. Um, and so, you've got private businesses or companies bidding for contracts to carry out local government services. Um, and so in Wandsworth, for example, we have a situation where, that should say 87, not, not, not 97, um, you've got, um, or maybe you should say 77. Don't write the number, the, uh, the years were confusing. Just think of it as like in the, in the, in the 80s. Um, so you've got, you've got the, staff in, the, the staff of Wandsworth Council being cut by 30% um, in this period. Um, and so, yeah, you, so the situation where basically, the, the, by the way, local councils get forced to give up public service and public services to private sector. So, the, I mean, the, the, the rubbish collection is the best example. Any council you live in, in most cases, councils now contract out garbage collection. And I always hear like those Biffa trucks that go around, that's like a public sector company. It's them driving around buying it all the time, all got the screen. Um, so, the counter argument though is that. She was really only able to achieve this through an expansion of central government power. So if we look at the 1988 Local Government Act, that act gave the central government, aka Thatcher in Parliament, etc., it gave them the power to force local councils to accept the most competitive contracts they were offered to help keep costs down. So she implements these policies which, which reduce the size of local government, but she forces them to do it by increasing her own legal powers over the local councils. So at the same time, central government becomes stronger and expands. Um, final point about local, gov about local government. Um, 
But you know, just look back at uh, this chap here again in Livingston. Um, is this showdown that she had with the GLC? Um, so she again, she reigns in the power of local council by basically abolishing some councils. Yeah. The Greater London Council. Yes, I'll mention it briefly. The GLC is the Greater London Council. Um, it's run by a group of left-wing Labour MPs, led by Ken Livingstone. Um, I will say actually, because I'm going to go over it in a bit as well, it's worth noting, ideologically, um, they're what people refer to as the new left. People like Ken Livingstone, they're considered to be, they're considered to be very left-wing, but actually, what, makes the, what distinguishes Ken Livingstone from, from like other traditional very left-wing socialist people is they're also very much committed to greater equality for all people. So Ken Livingstone, he's really big on campaigning for things like ethnic minority rights and LGBT rights. That's not a thing at the time. Like Ken Livingstone in the 1980s is one of the few high-profile high politicians who's publicly campaigning for things like ethnic minority rights and LGBT rights. It's extremely rare. Um, and so that's kind of a, that's kind of a, a hallmark of the new left, um, all the ideas they bring in. Um, so, yeah, you have a situation where the GLC is taken over by Ken Livingston and other councillors from the new left. And so, like I said, it's basically, think of it as traditional labour policies, um, like or, you know, left-wing policies, in addition to things like commitment to greater equality for ethnic minorities and like other minorities, women, women, LGBT, etc. Uh, and also a commitment to nuclear disarmament. So you've got Ken aiming to basically create urban socialism. So some of the things he does in London, for example, is he subsidises, they, they subsidise underground travel. Um, and they do that by hiking up taxes. Um, they offer financial support for LGBT groups. They give them lots of money, actually, like hundreds of millions of pounds, um, maybe hundreds of thousands. I'm exaggerating. Um, they give funding to Black and Asian rights groups, like the Race Today Collective, led by Darkus Howe. These groups are considered to be sort of like radical Black activist groups. They get funding from the GLC as well. Um, they spend this. This one's actually hilarious. Like what a troll. Um, they there are, there is money which is set aside by the government that they give them in the event of a nuclear attack. Ken Livingston basically spends that money on an anti-nuclear weapons campaign, um, which really infuriates Thatcher. He also publishes secret nuclear war plans. So there was actually a plan um, by possibly MI5, the government or the army, where London would basically be surrounded in the event of a nuclear attack to prevent people from leaving. Um, the idea being, according to the book, who knows if they're exaggerating, the idea being supposedly that um, better people to basically just die in London than starve to death in the rest of the country. So like, you basically get trapped into London to, 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 not, to not let you evacuate and you basically die in nuclear attack. I read that and I thought, that can't be right. But well, why is he not in prison? Huh? Why is he not in prison for doing that? You can't just do that on you. Yeah, that, that's another thing. I thought that was like, that's a bit dodgy. He leaked the, leak the plans. Well, whatever, he leaked it. What can he do? It's not his fault. No, but what? Yeah, surely, like. Yeah, well, that's what I thought. That, that's arguably illegal. Yeah, anyway, so he, he leaks these secret, secret nuclear war plans. Um, so, anyway, it's just those kinds of things. He also seemed to be supportive of terrorism. By terrorism, we basically mean he supports Nelson Mandela and he endorses Mandela at a time when, of course, um, all of England and the Western world was claiming as terrorists. Um, so, Ken Livingston supports terrorism, basically supports Mandela. Uh, he also, more controversial than that, um, he invites Jerry Adams. Jerry Adams is the leader of Sinn Féin, um, who obviously are linked to the IRA, who are involved in, a, in an insurgency campaign um, in Ireland. S-I-N-N-F-E-I-N. -N. Um, so Sinn Féin. He invites Jerry Adams, the leader of Sinn Féin, to London to basically speak at a conference. And he even organises a meeting between Jerry Adams and like other like leaders of like radical organizations. So the guy is just provoking Thatcher endlessly for like two years non-stop. Or like not two, he's more than that. He's just endlessly provoking Thatcher. And so her response to his provocation and his policies is she abolishes the GLC in 1986. Um, she claims that it was responsible for high tax and public spending, and so she abolishes the GLC. Um, so again, you could um, you could use that as an argument to say that actually it's an example of the government reigning in local government because um, they're spending, etc., intervention and things. Or you could also argue actually um, 
it's an example of Thatcher extending her power um, over the local government that refused to that refused to abide by her policies. And so she was unable to enforce her policies, so she extends her power by abolishing disobedient councils or troublesome councils or local authorities. So again, you can you can swing it either way. Um, okay, last few points, um, we'll wrap up for this bit. Um, is you can also argue that she actually increases the size of the state. So there's she reduces it, it changes, or you can actually say it actually increases. The first way is um, she actually increases powers of um, law enforcement in terms of things like dealing with the unions, dealing with crime, etc. The first thing is, so it talks about how Thatcher, obviously, is on a collision course with the unions, and so to help deal with the trade unions, she basically extends state or expands state power um, and allows the state to control aspects of union activity more than before. So they pass law, she passes a law that outlaws two things, secondary action and secondary picketing. Secondary action is basically sympathetic striking. Um, the miners are on strike, so the rail workers also go on strike. So they, if, if, if you know your union history, which I hope some of you do, if they find it confusing, Stanley Baldwin in 1927 initially outlaws Sympathetic strikes in the Trade Dispute Act, and then um, yeah, so Baldwin, Baldwin, Baldwin outlaws it, and then Labour reintroduce it. Sorry, get rid of that act in the 1950s, and then <coughs> Thatcher brings it back. So yeah, so they outlaw synthetic strikes. We never got told about this. Five minutes. Um, so next thing. Um, secondary picketing is basically when you picket or you protest or you, you kind of take a strike action to places that aren't directly affected by the, the place of your work. So let's say your let's say your Ford workers, Ford Dagenham plant, on strike because um, of your work conditions. You go on strike from work, but then you start picketing the showroom as well. The showroom isn't where you work. Go on. So, that, so basically, you, you go, you pick it in places that are not directly related to your district. So, so that aren't directly affected, affecting your industry. So, okay. for example, if you're a Ford worker and you go on strike, car workers, secondary picketing would be picketing the showrooms. People can't go to the showroom and buy cars. Like that's not where you work. But they're, they're private businesses that are selling cars. So that would be secondary picketing. A picket is basically, when you go on strike, you create a picket line um, where you basically, you're meant to kindly request that workers and people do not cross your picket line into that work of, that place of work. So if you're on a strike in a, in a mine, the picket line would be set up and you'd be trying to prevent people from going to work on it. In theory, it's meant to be a request, but in reality, it becomes quite an aggressive, you're not coming in here, otherwise you're in trouble. Um, so yeah, picketing is a, one of the methods people employ during strikes. Um, so, last LGBT charge passed as well. She, unions are for, she passes a law that forces unions to call a secret ballot if they wish to go on strike. And to, to call those secret ballots, sorry, well, to, get those, to get those secret ballots, um, yeah, so they have to call the secret ballot before going on strike, and they have to win a, major, a majority prior to strike action. Before this, Union bosses can basically call strikes and go on leaving, no problem. Um, they also have this other law um, where you can only impose a closed shop by a secret ballot of majority of majority members. So again, to impose a closed shop, you need to have a majority of members. A closed shop is basically, because no one's no none of you know that is, a closed shop is basically when um, a union or an or industry, to work in that industry, in that, in that factory or whatever, you have to be part of a specified trade union. So trade unions would often impose on, a, on, on, their, on their employers a closed shop, which meant that employer would have to agree to not employ anybody unless they are part of that trade union specifically. Um, which that's kind of bizarre to think of it now, but yeah. People have to, bosses have to only employ people from that union. Yeah. Essentially, they, 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 they would force they would force the bosses 
to accept that condition. If they refuse, they go on strike. And some bosses agree to it, some bosses don't agree to it. Um, but again, so the law means makes it so that you can only oppose a closed shop by secret ballot majority of members. So you clearly have Thatcher extending her powers to reduce the strength of trade unions um, and kind of help achieve that aim, just the first thing. The second thing she also does to increase the power of the state, uh, quite significantly in fact, is in terms of, like I said, defense and law and order operations. So defense spending rises significantly under Thatcher due to the international climate, uh, international climate being the Cold War basically and other kind of international disputes. So it goes up 20%. And that's mainly to fund things like the purchase of Trident nuclear deterrent missiles from the Americans. Um, so Trident is the UK's nuclear deterrent. They're basically submarines that go around the country um, anonymously, like as a nuclear deterrent. They're there right now. Yes. And they're always there. Yeah. There's always, I'm not sure actually the exact way it work functions, but the point is, it's a nuclear deterrent. So we buy, we buy, we buy it from the Americans and then rent it off them essentially. Let's try the Americans. Yeah, it's American made. The American made missiles and sell it to us. Um, so, yeah, so she buys Trident, for example. Um, she also gets involved in the Falklands military operations. So, defense spending has to increase as a result. Um, however, it was worth saying defense spending does eventually drop um, on conventional weapons to help fund the nuclear costs instead. Um, but the really significant one is the extension of police powers. Um, police powers are significantly extended. In particular, she passes several laws that enhance the abilities, powers, sorry, the police's ability and powers to stop and search people. Um, we're going to go into that in a bit more detail when we look at um, the Brixton riots, because um, it often involves essentially stopping and searching black men. Um, but she basically enhances the, the power of the police to stop and search people, um, in addition to their powers to arrest and charge people who are involved in protests and pickets. So the police suddenly have an expansion of their powers. Additionally, she restricts press freedoms um, on a range of issues related to national security. So she bans documentary that's being made on something called the Zircon satellite. So this report has been is conducted into how the British government apparently is launching a satellite called Zircon. Um, or sorry, had this thing called Zircon which basically intercept uh, communications. I can't remember the exact nature of it. It's something which the British were working on. The BBC were initially going to get the documentary. The, the government steps in, forces them to not air it, and they confiscate all this guy's research, and they can't publish it, they can't do anything about it. Isn't that freedom of speech? Right, so that's what we're saying. The, 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 her government restricts press freedom. So it's an increase in the size of the state in terms of their ability to restrict people's freedoms. Because of national security, that's the kind of reasoning. Um, they also, they have this book, that a former MI5 officer wants to publish, they ban it because they don't want to be published because they might leak secrets. Additionally, they impose heavy restrictions on, um, on, how, on giving interviews or promotion of the IRA or Sinn Féin in the media, so you broadcast. So you're not allowed to broadcast interviews um, with IRA or Sinn Féin members on television. Um, That's terrible. And again, the idea being that it might promote them as an organisation potentially. So again, you've got press freedom being restricted as a result. All of these things, the key, common, the common thread here being, it's in the interest of protecting national security or the national interest. So things that are seen to protecting national security or law and order, she is willing to increase the size of the state and state powers to help achieve this. Um, or protecting what? No. National, the national interest or national security. And the last thing is, in the terms of how we can argue she increased the size of the state, we talked about already, and this, this I'll come back to it, that she did try to attempt to reduce the welfare bill and the size of the welfare state. Um, however, despite those attempts that she made, the reality is, across the board, um, the size of the welfare state increased. So, if we look at the spending of public services across the range of sectors continue to increase, so the NHS... NHS spending increases by up to, by 35% between 79 and 89 in real terms, real terms being meaning against inflation, so it's rising above inflation or along with inflation. Um, the Social Security Bill, so again, provision of like welfare benefits, etc., those continue to rise despite the means testing. They don't decline, the bill continues to increase. And state pensions do not decline either. People continue to pick up state pensions. So it fails to do that. Additionally, 
state power. Wait, is social security for welfare benefits? Yeah, it includes welfare benefits, welfare benefits, things like that. A range, it's, it's a range of, it's not just welfare benefits, it's, other, it's not just welfare benefits, it's other kind of benefits as well. And then lastly, schools. Thatcher's government sees the most significant shake-up and increase in state power over education in generations. Um, Thatcher basically introduced the national curriculum. There are concerns over the quality of education, um, and also that potentially you've got local socialist councils ruining education. Um, and so she uses the national curriculum for the first time, and along with it comes national um, league tables which publish results for testing at several age groups, 7, 11, and 14, as well as obviously 16. Um, so the national curriculum being published for the first time with standardised education across the country to an extent, uh, that's a significant increase in state power in terms of their control of education. It wasn't like that beforehand. Schools based in local, in local areas did their own thing, basically. Um, you also have the creation of grant-maintained schools, which basically allows schools to opt out of local authority control and receive instead funding from central government. So you're still government funded, but the local authority no longer has any control over you instead. Um, and so a lot of schools opt out local. So you have local government, local, local educational authorities losing a lot of their control of some schools who choose to opt out of their control and become grant maintained. With um, so local education authorities, or local authorities, but local education authorities, LEAs. Um, so, so previously the way it works is they fund you, and as well they also control you. Yeah. They, they, they control your school in every way, shape, or form. Um, so this grant maintained schools, you're basically no longer under local authority control, and instead you get money directly from the central government. And the idea behind it is, again, we have all these horrible left-wing socialist councils ruining the country, they're also ruining the kids' education. So we have to create means by which schools can escape their clutches and teach kids properly. Uh, yeah, I got it. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, there's three ways you can basically argue anything about state intervention. Um, it increases the size of the state, the state actually does shrink, or you can argue the role of the state basically changes. So we'll leave that on 